In part one of this video, we saw several different theories that relate to interpersonal communication. Here we're going to look at Connor and Fitzpatrick's family communication patterns theory. In this theory, there are two different orientations. You can kind of see it as scales that people have within their family structure. The first scale is the conversation orientation. This is the degree to which family members feel like they can have unrestrained interaction with each other. How openly can they communicate or, if not, how much restriction needs to be placed on their type of communication. So if you have a really high conversation orientation, you and your family members, when you get together, feel free to talk about almost anything. You have open dialogue. If you have a low conversation orientation, then there's very little conversation. Or if you do have conversation, sometimes it can feel like you're doing it out of routine or you're just talking about the safe topics. The other scale is conformity orientation. This is the degree to which families realize that they are similar or they're different from each other, from other family members. If you have a high conformity orientation, then you are going to emphasize those similarities. How are we alike as family members? If you emphasize the diversity and the difference, then you obviously are low in the conformity orientation. When these scales play out, we see different types of family structures emerge. One of those being the consensual family. Now the consensual family has high conversation and high conformity orientations. So in this type of case, we see there's a lot of conversation. People want to express their ideas, but in most cases, most family members will have very similar views to each other. So there's going to be a lot of agreement. As an example, I picked the Kardashian-Jenner family. From the outside looking in, it seems like they have a lot of rich conversations. Everyone, no matter how old they are, is encouraged to voice their opinion. However, when you really boil it down, they have very similar opinions to each other. So they have high conformity as well, which probably helps with agreement. That even though they have these crazy busy lives, they still feel very closely connected and they feel like they agree with each other a lot. Another type of family is the pluralistic family, which we see on the show Modern Family. And there's a lot of rich conversation because you're high in conversation orientation, but there's low conformity because you're such a diverse group of people. In this case, there's going to be open debate where views are judged on merit. If you look at the show, you'll notice that there are times where they have really strong disagreements and they voice those differences through the conversations. But the thing is, because they are such a high conversation family, they're okay with dealing with some of those debates. And in fact, collaboration is encouraged. So when they tackle the Gloria's speaking Spanglish moments or how do we navigate dealing with the kids or kids fighting with other kids, they have those debates, may get a little crazy every now and then, but in the end, they all do work together. Then there's the protective family. Here we have low conversation and high conformity. In this case, there's really a strong order. There's obedience, there's family norms that are enforced. For example, the Von Trapp family, pre-Maria. If you look at the Von Trapp children before Maria enters their life, they very, very rarely have conversations with their father. Everything is very much out of routine and out of respect for his position as their father, but it doesn't actually feel like genuine conversation about who they are as people. And there's a high level of conformity. They are even wearing the same outfit in this case. Then there's the laissez-faire family. In this family, there's low conversation and low conformity. Because there's low conversation and low conformity, there tends to be few emotional bonds. Now, I could not find a clear example in media, so I just picked a picture with this kid who was sitting there while his parents are on their phones. 
in this type of family, children usually do make their own decisions about what they're going to do or about how they're going to function in this world. I've had a few friends who have a laissez-faire family, and from their perspective, they felt that either it taught them really great independence because they learned how to be an adult very early on, but for a few other friends, it felt for them like they were raising themselves. Keep in mind, no matter if you are a consensual family, a pluralistic family, a protective family, or a laissez-faire family, what is considered the best structure for you and your family members is really going to depend on the personalities and the different type of people involved. Because what's good for one family may not be good for another family. What one family member prefers may not be great for another family member. I know I feel like my mother likes the protective status of her family where I think she would like more conversation but she does want us to feel very similar to each other whereas I on the other hand would love a pluralistic family where we have really high open conversations and we emphasize those differences maybe having a few debates here and there which could get a little little testy but at least we'd be focusing on collaboration again it's going to depend on what works for you and what doesn't work for you. So that completes part two of those interpersonal communication theories.